So uh, yeah, as Prof. Mendelssohn was saying, I am Amina Zaffanini. I am an infectious disease resident doctor in Italy, in Verona. And I am here for an observership and I will be with you at Grotes here for a couple of months. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and to have this opportunity. Um, today, I'm going to present a case from my hospital in Italy. Um, and as first uh, slides, I just wanted to show you some pictures of my city of Verona for uh, if anybody of you uh, knows it, I know for sure that some of you actually came and visited. Um, these are three of the most probably famous places in Verona. At the upper left, you have a picture of Lake Garda, and that's a lake really nice close by to Verona. On the right, upper right, there is a picture of one of the uh, amphitheaters of the Roman old city that we have. And at the very bottom, it's a picture of the um, amphitheater arena where you can still go to listen to concerts and opera. But these are really famous pictures of really famous places in, in Verona. And these uh, instead are some more specific pictures of something that is more uh, less uh, famous. Those are two gardens uh, of Verona um, that you can actually visit just once a year when there is a special event called Open Gardens in Veronetta. And that's a really uh, nice event that happens the first weekend of September. So it just happened this last weekend. So if you will ever go to Verona in September, remember that you have this opportunity and that we have really nice gardens there. And this will also um, I didn't choose this uh, to show you these pictures by chance, but just because in some way it, it connects to the case that I'm going to present today. So this is our the clinical case that we are going to discuss today. Um, the patient is a 33 years old male. He's married, doesn't have any kids. He works as a factory worker and he really likes gardening in his spare time. In his background, we have a history of seasonal allergic rhinitis and recurrent upper respiratory tract infections. In 2012, he was hospitalized for cutaneous abscesses treated with antibiotics and surgery. And since 2018, so for two years, he is now complaining anosmia, burning sensation in the nose, difficulty in swallowing, and he was diagnosed with allergic rhinitis and treated with topical steroids. But this treatment didn't actually work because after a couple of years in summer last year, he came back to the hospital um, saying that his symptoms got worse, that he had gingival retractions, recurrent aftos ulcers and a pain in the palate. And he was starting to notice also a hole in his heart palate. We performed a CT scan and we confirmed the fact that he actually had a heart palate perforation um, some polyps were also described in his nose, and he had an inflammatory maxillary sinus disease. So um, here I just wanted to uh, present a differential diagnosis of midline destructive lesions that can be caused by many different uh, causes, neoplastic ones, autoimmune, traumatic, being probably cocaine-induced midline granuloma, the most frequent seen, and other like sarcoidosis and eosinophilic granuloma. And then, of course, we have the infection causes. Um, I would like you, if you want, to participate to the, um, to the presentation, opening your phones and digiting on your internet, menti.com. That's an app where you can just answer some questions that I will, that I will ask you. Like, if you have any uh, idea of infectious causes of midline destructive lesions. So if you, if you open the app, menti.com, then you have to enter the code 9969. 2916 that it's up here and so you can then just write your ideas so we will interact a little bit more in this presentation and we'll of course no names are going to come out and there is no uh, correct or incorrect answer it's just to um to do it together so you can just type your ideas and they will get in the in this in the screen tell me if you don't if you don't, if you can't get in the in the site, if everything is working. Yeah, available. Okay. Okay, so I see staph aureus, NTM, aspergillus, mucor, yeah, mucor mycosis, bacterial. Hemophilus influenzae, moraxella, sporotrichosis, very nice. Granulomatose disease. 
so pneumonia. Okay, I think we have some, very good. I'm gonna show you what I found in the literature. Um, okay, this is a review of um, the, some midline descriptive lesions published in the American Journal of Auto, Auto Laryngo Laryngology. <laughs> um, and some of the most frequent uh, causes of uh, infections that cause midline descriptive lesions are reported. We have bacteria, fungi with many, many different fungi and protozoa also with leishmaniasis, for example. Then going back to our case, um, we performed some blood tests and the results were a foot blood count being normal, uh, CRP and PCT normal, HIV negative, syphilis negative, serum galatumanan was negative, but we had a very high beta D-glucan being higher than 200, than 533. So a biopsy was performed, and this is the picture of the culture. If you have, you can go back to your phone, and if you have any guess of what this can be, just type it, whatever you think that that can be. Very good, alternaria, spergillus, porotrichosis. Anything else? Mucor. So yeah, molds. Sporo. Bipolaris. Okay, very nice. Let's go back to the presentation. So this is what we actually found. So the biopsy showed a granulomatous inflammatory reaction at the culture flagged positive for alternaria alternata, as one of you actually said. Um, I reported here the picture of the, um, the result with the beta D-glucan being, being really positive and the alternaria alternata being isolated on the culture. Um, so just a brief introduction of what alternaria alternata is. In a, is it's an ubiquitous dematiaceous fungus distinguished by the predominance of melanin in its cells. It's a saprophyte in soil and it can be a plant pathogen. It's a very big problem for uh, tomatoes, for example, and just infrequently cause um, infections in humans. When it does, it infects mainly immunocompromised hosts and in immunocompetent, it's just sometimes associated with allergies, not with real infections. Uh, the portal of entry of the infection is usually through a corneal trauma or breakdown of the skin barrier. What do we do? What do we know about alternaria alternata? You can go back to your phones. And I just wrote some, um, some things about alternaria alternata and just one of them, it's not true. The other ones are true. So just pick the one that you think it's not true between this one. So it can cause invasive diseases, surgery may be required. It's resistant to itraconazole. It causes pheophomycosis and um, the cutaneous infection is the most common presentation. You can just pick one that it's not true. All the other ones are true about it. Okay, very good. So it was not true that it's resistant to itraconazole. All the other things were actually true. So um, it can cause invasive disease, surgery may be required, and the cutaneous infection is the most frequent manifestation. So here we have a review of 210 cases of alternariosis published in Clinical Microbiology and Infection in 2008. These 210 cases were um, found since 1933 until uh, 2007 and seven. And in this review, we can see that the most frequent clinical manifestations are cutaneous and subcutaneous infections being the 74%, followed by oculomycosis, invasive and non-invasive rhinosinusitis and onychomycosis. It can also be found on normal human and animal skin and conjunctiva. And this is why I called this presentation friend or foe because sometimes it can just be on, your, on our skin without giving us any real infection. 
in and patients have normally a history of soil and sometimes also garbage uh, exposure and that's why i show you the the gardens in verona we have many beautiful gardens but we have to remember that they can actually be sometimes dangerous um, and this is particularly true for um, immunocompromised hosts. The most important risk factors are, in fact, solid organ transplantation, bone marrow transplantation, and steroids, um, steroids therapy and Cushing syndrome. Um, it normally have a good response to uh, conventional antifagan drugs, with itraconazole being the drug most, uh, mostly used. And in some occasions, in patients in, in steroid, with steroid therapy, the reduction or suppression of the therapy can be sufficient to resolve the infection, even if it's rare. Uh, this is a literature, literature review of cutaneous alternariosis. We have 18 cases of um, alternaria being alternaria alternata, the most frequently uh, described. Um, and we can see that almost every patient ex except one, that's the one described in the, um, in the case record, have um, uh, an immune deficiency. The, major the most of them have, um, they are transplanted, so they had a solid organ transplantation. We have a couple of them with an autoimmune disease. And yeah, as I said, just one of them is a healthy, a healthy individual. Um, so our question afterwards was, is it just the alternaria giving this patient these rhinosinusites and this uh, heart palate perforation, or is there anything else underlying? So we suspected an autoimmune disease or an, or an immunodeficiency. We performed some blood tests and we had all the autoantibodies being negative, normal. The complementemia and the immunoglobulins were also normal, but we found an elevated um, IgG4 count. So together with our rheumatologists, a diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyangitis and IgG4 related disease was done um, because of his clinical features, the high IgG4 that were actually found also on the histology and the characteristic histological findings. Uh, these are two um, articles that actually describe the EGG4 related disease and the uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis as being uh, overlap syndrome, with the EGG4 EGG RNA ratio being also a possible marker of disease activity of uh, um, granulomatosis with polyangitis. So what we have now is a patient with a midline destructive lesion complicated with alternaria alternata infection and rhinosinusitis. Uh, our patient was treated, of course, with antifungal therapy, but also with surgical debridement that, that is uh, often described in literature to be necessary to eradicate completely the infection. Uh, talking about antifungal treatment, which antifagan therapy would you start? So let's go back to the presentation here. If you know which antifungal are actually active for alternaria alternata. I just typed some, some of them are active and some are not. So you can choose more than one. And in fact, more than one are actually active for, for alternaria. Okay, very nice. This is true. Amphotericin um, B and itraconazole are active, but these are not the only one. Also, posaconazole and caspofungin can be active for, for alternaria. I'm going to show you now what was the result of here on the right and the upper right. You have the culture of our alternaria with his sensibility pattern. And it was actually sensitive to posaconazole, itraconazole, and amphotericin. And at the bottom, you can see a picture of the big review of 210 cases um, done in 2008 where the MIC of the most, um, the most uh, used antifungal therapy were checked. And you can see that amphotericin B was, um, was um, really, sent, were really active for alternative in most of the cases. And that's actually one of the most used uh, drugs also in the, um, in the case reports that I found in the literature. Also, posaconazole was, um, 
was considered act active and itraconazole, as, as I said before, it's the one that is actually most used to treat this infection, but also voriconazole and caspofungin um, are active. And I found some cases of itraconazole, of relapse of patients with itraconazole um, that were actually treated with itraconazole, they were then switched to caspofungin or amphotericin B and then treated with, uh, with those antifungal therapies. So as conclusion, I just wanted to say that alternaria species are rare, but increasingly recognized opportunistic infections among immunocompromised patients, also because um, our uh, population is uh, always more immunocompromised with transplants and hematological malignancies. My last thoughts, and those are actually the problems that we had uh, in treating this particular case was how long do we treat these patients? Like the treatment duration, do we, when, when, when are we safe in stopping the, the antifungal therapy? And then on the other hand, how do we manage their immunosuppressive therapies? In this particular case, um, also an autoimmune disease was diagnosed. So he needed also to start corticosteroids or rituximab. So when would you feel safe in starting this? Um, these therapies. And then last, how do we do the, the follow-up in patients like this? So these are open questions. And if you, wanna, um, if you want to just say what you think and just have a discussion about this, of course, there is no correct answer. It's just to uh, discuss the case together. This was our, yeah, our concern in, uh, in the management of these patients. Fantastic. I mean, uh, what a what a wonderful case. Thank you very much indeed. If you could you. stop your, if you could yeah. stop sharing the screen, if you could put yeah. your video on so we can see you. Of course. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, again, a, a really, really wonderful case. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm sure that there are, are um, going to be <clears throat> questions from colleagues. Um, I mean, maybe I'll I'll start. What, one of the questions uh, before talk, trying to address your yours is, um, I mean, what what is the place of surgery, um, considering that there's a uh, there's a defect in the palate, um, and obviously if you're if you are uh, treating, hopefully if there's improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. benefit from the treatment the the actual mucosal surface may um, may re, you know reform but there's a there's a now a, a large defect in the bone is there any surgical was there any surgical input given actually it uh, the treated the patient was treated with surgery but just for the uh, rhinosinusitis so the the hole in the bone in the in the palate was not closed by the sur by, by the surgeons and actually we had this problem with the follow up because at the beginning like when we um, checked with the mri after i think it was 3 or 4 weeks of therapy the hole was still there and it was going to and it was actually bigger so the, the surgery was done, but just to um, clean the, sinu the sinus and not to close the palate. So that, the problem of the palate was more something about, in one, the, from one point of view, his granulomatosis with polyangitis, and on the other hand, also the fungal infection. So um, the palate was not treated with, with surgery. But then at the end of, like after four, four months, it actually closed. So at the end, it's closed by, by itself. Okay, no, fantastic. Uh, I mean, I'd be really interested to know what colleagues think about the questions that you've posed. I mean, firstly, the issue of treatment duration and prophylaxis. I mean, the, you've got somebody with an underlying immune deficiency. I mean, unless you can uh, radically alter that. I mean, I think firstly, you're looking at a long, a long duration of therapy, probably months. But I mean, I, I would be concerned about stopping prophylaxis, secondary prophylaxis, because, you know, again, you, you've got somebody who this could, this could recur. So I think, you know, you may be looking at very long term itraconazole prophylaxis if you can't mm -hmm. really get, get to grips with the underlying immune deficiency. Follow up really difficult. I mean, probably uh, relates to uh, beta D glucan levels, perhaps as you've got an initial 
BTD glue can to work with, um, although the sensitivity of that and how it really relates in follow up, I'm not sure. Um, and again, radiological imaging um, may or may not help you. Um, and, I, and I think as you're going to keep the patient, I would keep the patient on long term prophylaxis uh, with itraconazole once I'd finished. But I mean, perhaps um, nobody's putting their hand up, but perhaps I can put some people on the spot. Jan Lut, what do you what do you think? All right, Prof. Yeah, I don't think there's a good answer for for the question that you pose. Um, yeah, I, mean, I would think um, um, at least sort of six months, of, or at least to a point where the the patients had um, clinical, um, well, from a clinical point of view, has resolved, and is to a point where um, he's at a minimal um, immunosuppressives, um, and yeah, at least six months, probably even more. Yeah, with those two caveats. Yeah, no, thank. Would you continue pro for long term prophylaxis? Yeah, as I said, I would. I'm continue sorry, long no, I missed it. Yeah, so, so so I would I would continue long term uh, prophylaxis, and um, if, uh, many months, you know, dates of six months, and to a, and only consider um, stopping once uh, the the patients at uh, a point where the immunosuppressives have been weaned to sort of a minimum minimal amount, um, but but even that even that would be sort of uh, sort of, you know, thumb suck, based case. Sure. I think there is there's, there's, um, sort of definite guidance okay. in, in, in the scenario. No. So, Amina, what, what, was, what did you decide to do? What were your discussions in Verona? Uh, so, in, with this specific case, we decided uh, he was treated initially with amphotericin B, but then he had a really bad renal failure with hypokalemia. So, we switched him to posaconazole, and that was continued for four months. And for the other, for the granulomatosis with polyangitis, we decided to treat him with immunoglobulins uh, after, after the first MRI that was not showing improvement. And after immunoglobulins, actually, he got a little bit better. And at the end, the, 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 the infection resolved and we stopped the therapy at four months. But I found, for example, a nice article of the Mayo Clinic of um, eight transplanted patients. Um, with alter, alternaria infection and the median duration for those patients was around seven months of treatment. And just one of them um, was uh, with posaconazole prophylaxis like lifelong. So seven months was the, was the, the, the average for, for example, for that, for that uh, case series. Oh, interesting. Thanks very much. So, I mean, our microbiology colleagues, I'm obviously going to put you on the spot here. How many of these have we, Altanara, have we ever, have we seen, or it, do you think, I mean, have, do you remember seeing cases here at Kudaskia or uh, in your practices elsewhere in South Africa? No, I haven't, Mark. It's very interesting. Chad, um, Nasli, anybody seen a case, I Amanda? Just, um, no, but I've got the data. I just, I just need a minute to go look and see how, you know, if we've had any, definitely not like a necrotizing kind of uh, um, invasive alternaria infection, not even one, but just outside that a few alternarias, I'm sure. Very rare. So in, uh, so again, in Verona, um, Amina, how, in Italy, how many do you see or, I mean, it's, it's obviously not coming. Uh, <laughs> Pathogen. Actually, this was the only only case that I personally seen. Um, but probably in bigger centers where they have more immunodepressed patients, uh, you would see one every I don't know couple of years probably. Um, but yeah, in my experience, that yeah, I've been working there in the infectious disease clinic for just three years. But this is the only case that I've seen of Alternaria. Yes. So would you suggest screening everybody that goes to the Veronetta? <laughs> no, not probably, not probably. But yeah, but it's something that we need to keep in mind just about in general, about molds and uh, yeah, fungi in, in plants and places like gardens. That's something, uh, yeah, I would think about if I was immunodepressed. <laughs> well,